Well, I want to welcome you here today. I hope everyone enjoys uh, today's program. You know, I've really enjoyed having uh, the first Tuesdays around. The first Tuesday at the Metro Archives, we've been doing it now for several years, and um, people were coming in, and, and these presentations are a lot of fun. And so today we have Ridley Wills. Uh, he's going to speak on his uh, latest book. Ridley is a local historian, a writer, a researcher, and really he has a, he has a phenomenal memory. So I'm, I'm glad you're here. He can answer any questions you have about Nashville, surrounding area. So let me turn it over to Ridley, and we'll begin our program. Well, this is the first one I wrote, uh, Nashville Pikes, uh, 150 years long. Franklin Pike and Granny White, and I did it because I raised the money to restore Glen Levin for the land trust between 2011 and 2013, and I just got interested in all the adjoining plantations, and pretty soon I was into a book. And uh, I intended that my second book, the second volume, here with this magnificent house on 25th Avenue South on the Covenant that Karen Eaton lives in, would be about Hillsborough Pike and, and and Harding Pike. And then I realized if I did that, it's gonna be twice as big as this. So I backed off and just wrote about Hillsborough Pike's historic sites. And I'll read you some from this book. Uh, but let me tell you, I have written four more of these Pike's books. I haven't published them, but I have written 95% of them. Uh, and uh, when I write about well, this spring I'll bring out one on Harding Pike, and it's gonna be big. I told my editor this morning that I wanna cut some of it out because it's gonna, people don't like great big books. <laughs> and so she is gonna cut about six of the houses out. And uh, a couple of them, Crom Tidwell uh, wrote about in his book, uh, Bellamy Park, and uh, he has pictures of them, so Margaret Ann Robinson will excuse me for leaving her house out. Uh, in the fall, I'm, I've written a book on Charlotte Pike going all the way around to White's Creek Pike, including Hyde's Pike, Buena Vista Pike, and Charlotte and White's Creek. And I've written most of it. And then I write about Dickinson, Dickinson Pike and Gallatin Pike, and I've written that. And then my last one would be from Lebanon Pike all the way around to Nolensville Road. But you find out such interesting things. For example, I've written about Dickerson Pike and I find out that George A. Dickel, whom the distillery is named down in Cascade Creek, lived all his adult life two and a half miles from town on Dickerson Pike. Now who would have believed that? And his next door neighbor was a man named Swab from Germany, Victor Emanuel Swab. His nickname was Nanny. And he actually owned Bickle. He lived next door. Now nobody would think that. Uh, I just wrote about Rosemont, J.J.B. Southall's plantation on Murfrey Pike at Mill Creek. People don't know about that. And so uh, I want them to know about it and I want people to uh, to enjoy these books. And one of the differences between my books and any other books I've ever seen are that all of these books are gonna have color-coded maps in them showing you what the sites are, whether they're churches, homes, Civil War sites, railroad schools. And uh, here's a list of this, all of these for, uh, this is Franklin and Granny White. And I've done that for Hillsborough, and I'll do it for Harding Pike, and I'll do it for all of them. So if you, you know, you know where Melrose Shopping Center is, you know where the Melrose Theater was, but you're not sure where the Melrose Plantation is. Well, you can find out. Um, my father was an Irish hybridizer. He was president of the American Irish Society. And uh, one day, Irene and I were in London with our children who were young, and we took them up to Kew Gardens on the Thames, and it was August. And my oldest son, who's more idealistic than my second oldest son, who's a physician, 
said, I wonder if any of Granddad's iris are in Kew Gardens, which is the finest gardens in England. And we walked over to some iris beds, and workmen were right then dividing rhizomes, because you need to do that with iris. And the first iris my children saw was Nashboro, their grandfather's iris. And they, I had an appreciation for him that they didn't have before that. So I put an iris story uh, in my Hillsborough Pikes book, and I'll just read it to you. It's not, it's not long. When my father, Jesse Wills, was an undergraduate at Vanderbilt, he learned that Chancellor Kirkland often worked in his Irish garden late in the afternoons. Jesse occasionally watched the Chancellor hybridize Iris in his campus garden where the medical complex is today. This is about 1921. For many years, Chancellor Kirkland, who lived on the south side of the Vanderbilt campus, north of Garland Avenue, had been in the habit of getting up at 5.30 nearly every day and working in his garden, setting out sweet potatoes in the spring and raising strawberries, lettuce, radishes, and onions. He shared his vegetables and flowers with all, of all kinds with his campus neighbors. When he had about exhausted the possibilities of vegetable and flower gardens, he suddenly discovered in 1920 a new interest a new passionate avocation, namely the hybridizing and selection of Irish plants. He soon got hold of some of the best varieties of Irish in the country and in England and found refuge in his Irish garden. The Irish garden gradually displaced the vegetable garden and at the height of the blooming system in May, thousands of people from the United States came to Nashville to see an acre or more of ground covered with tall, blooming, bearded iris. The chancellor did most of the work himself, planting, cultivating, pruning, fertilizing, and digging up rhizomes in August to divide them. He was a charter member of the American Irish Society in 1920 and was the first president of the Nashville Irish Society. He welcomed the American Irish Society to Nashville in 1935 and three years later won the Dykes Medal for his copper luster bearded iris. The Dykes was the highest honor that could come to an American iris grower. Kirkland's fame as a gardener spread far and wide, and it was often said that he was more widely known as an iris hybridizer than as a chancellor. That spring, Jesse Wills, then a life insurance executive, visited the iris gardens of his good friend, Chancellor Kirkland, and captivated, ordered his first plants through an Irish catalog. Largely due to Kirkland and Clarence Carmel, who was the maintenance supervisor at the Vanderbilt Hospital, the Tennessee legislature in 1933 dropped the daisy as the state flower and named the iris as the state flower. Carmel was the first Nashvillian to win a Dykes Medal he did so in 1929 with Dauntless, a red iris. In 1936, Mary Douglas Stallman, Mary Geddes Stallman, Ms. Edwin Stallman, and T.A. Washington collaborated to win a Dykes Medal for an apricot colored iris. Mary Geddes, uh, in, in recognition of uh, the growing popularity of iris, Nashville became known as the Irish city of the world. During Irish week, May 6 to 12, 1940, when the American Irish Society met in Nashville, Ms. Kirkland, a widow since 1939, was living on Jackson Boulevard, just east of Bellmead Boulevard, the second house on the left. And the backyard sloped down to that small creek that uh, between there and Honeywood. Her late husband's Irish garden, which sloped down a hillside to the creek, between Jackson and Sunnyside was on the tour, as were the gardens of Jesse Wills on Bellmead Boulevard, Stanley Horn on Golf Club Lane, Dr. L. C. Glenn on Garland Avenue, opposite the main entrance to Vanderbilt Hospital, and Geddes Douglas in Brentwood. And some of you may remember Geddes Douglas's nursery on the corner of Hobbs and Glen Eden, I guess. At the time, Wills was president of the National Irish Society. 
from 1943 until 1946, he was president of the American Irish Society and won the 1947 Dykes Medal with his tall, blue bearded Irish chivalry. In 1997, the Vanderbilt Garden Club had a bicentennial dedication of historic Irish breeded by Dykes Medal winners, Clarence Connell, Chancellor Kirkland, Ms. Stallman, and Jesse Wills. Uh, the name of Connell's Irish was Dauntless, and so he, he made $6,000 out of selling Dauntless bulbs, and uh, with that, bought 125 acres on a road between Madison and Goodlesville, and uh, I think it's Campbell Road. And anyway, he, uh, he named his house Dauntless Hill, and I've got to go out there and find that house because he is going to be in, uh, in my book on Dickerson Pike. I've written everything but his exact address, so I've got somehow to nail that down. Uh, the most prominent family on the Franklin Pike, turn of the century, with the Noel, with the Noel family, Oscar Noel, and uh, they actually owned land, almost to Franklin Pike, lots of land on uh, Granny White. They lived in a house where the apartment building is. Just after you come out over I four forty, it's on the right and the stone wall is still there. They also owned a, a several hundred acre field that extended from Walter Knowles stone wall on Hillsboro all the way out to Hillsboro High School. And uh, I found that an early Brigadier General under Jackson in the Creek, cam Creek campaign uh, lived on, on that property. Just really interesting. But he was not the biggest landowner on Hillsborough. The Compton family was the biggest landowner. There were one, two, three, four Compton homes. Only one of them is left, and it is the home of a cousin who lived on Tyne and uh, near where Tara Drive comes into Tyne, and it's uh, enclosed in the, in the embrace of some hills and the family cemeteries behind the house. It's hard to see it because of a cane break. The other three are gone. Uh, one of my best friends is Charles Compton Cook, Jr., who was the CEO of SunTrust here, and uh, more lately the CEO of uh, Paul Stum's bank in, in Belmont Shopping Center. And I'll talk about him later, but he is descended from the Comptons. Uh, John Compton, who lived in a house on the ridge across from North Stanford Drive, where Irby Simpkins later built a palatial house, uh, had black children before the Civil War and white children after the Civil War. He was also a unionist, although uh, the union took a lot of his stuff. He didn't particularly mind because he knew they needed it. But his black, black son was Joshua. And I write about Joshua in this book. Joshua Compton was born in 1855, the illegitimate mulatto son of prominent Davidson County farmer Henry W. Compton. Joshua's mother was a slave. Mr. Compton acknowledged Joshua as his son, gave him his name, and educated him, including sending him to Fisk University. After Joshua graduated from Fisk, he worked on his father's farm as an overseer. Now what that meant was he was largely overseeing his own family because a third of the slaves, uh, well ex-slaves, on the farm were Comptons. Joshua married and had children. Sometime after his father's death in 1873, he and his siblings inherited land on the east side of the Hillsborough Turnpike where Joshua built a two-story frame house. It was connected with Hillsborough by a dirt carriageway. And that carriageway is still there today. It's halfway up the hill between Tyne and South Stanford Drive. As you come to town, it's on the right. There used to be a lot of cedar trees on that lot, and Ms. Oscar Noel has a, had a house on the corner where Irene and I first married, when we were first married, lived in 1962. But that's where Joshua lived. 
He was a gifted man, a skilled artisan and a good farmer, proficient in building stone fences. A Republican, he was elected in 1885, 83 as a magistrate of the Davidson County Court and was deputy tax assessor in charge of the old district number 11 which embraced the Hillsborough Pike area and extended all the way over to Bell Mead. The next year was appointed to the executive committee of the Republican Party in Davidson County. During his 12 years as magistrate, he was supported by the big landowners, including William Hicks Jackson at Bell Mead. And uh, one day, a little boy was sitting on Stonewall on Hillsborough Pike where um, Otter Creek Road comes in. It was a store, a maize store on Hillsboro as you go out on the right side and Otter Creek comes in from the left side. This little boy looked down the pike and here comes General William Hicks Jackson of Bell Mead on a thoroughbred horse followed by 50 African Americans on mules. He paid their poll tax, which was a scheme to keep blacks from voting and they all voted straight for Josh Compton and anybody else he suggested. He couldn't vote himself because he had never been pardoned uh, by the Union after the war, and I don't understand that because he fought honorably, but that's not to say he didn't have political power as that little boy found out. Walter Stokes, Jr., who I knew and who grew up on the Hillsborough Turnpike, knew Joshua Compton. In 1955, Stokes remembered him as a skilled artisan with a good measure of practical education. Stokes added, I remember him well as the builder of stone fences in front of our place and as an influential Negro in our neighborhood. Joshua's children would make anybody proud. His daughter Ellen attended the National Normal and Theological Institute. His son Robert graduated from Meharry and uh, established a medical practice in Pasadena. His other children attended Roger Williams University. After receiving their educations, they left Nashville to become school teachers, supervisors, and lawyers in Indianapolis, Chicago, and Washington, D.C. Many Nashvilleans living along Hillsborough Pike and in the entire Nashville community from, say, 1920 to 1950 were well aware of the Black Compton presence on Hillsborough Pike in what was really an affluent white neighborhood. The 1940 census identified 10 Comptons living on Hillsborough Pike. Among those was Minnie, the 17-year-old daughter of Joshua's son, Trimble. Also listed in that census was Josh Compton, Jr., age 58 and single. Prominent Nashville lawyer Harlan Dodson, Jr. wrote Josh Compton, Jr.'s last will and testament. Compton paid him in barter by giving him possums and, and other animals. He, he, he was uh, well aware, he was, Compton was well known as a gardener and tiller of gardens. Well, in the 1940s, Joshua Compton, every spring, would drive out to Westview Avenue in Bell Mead to the home of Mr. and Ms. Charles W. Cook to till Ms. Cook's garden. And he would come out in a truck with a wagon behind it, and on the wagon he had two mules and a plow. So one day, Charlie, who's about eight years old, asked his mother, are we kin to him, mother? And she said, of course not. Well, of course he is kin to, he was kin to Joshua Compton. <laughs> They're both descended from John W. Compton on Hillsborough Pike, uh, <laughs> which, is, which is funny. Compton uh, Jr. also owned a 35-acre piece of land on the hill where Chickren Lane crosses the ridge to come down to Hillsborough. You know who I'm talking about? Vernon Sharp, who lived at Ingleham in Williamson County, owned the property to the south, but he didn't have access to it because Josh Compton Jr. owned it. So Charlie's daddy, Mr. Charles W. Cook, uh, and Bill Waller, one of Nashville's finest lawyers who wrote that book, Nashville in the 1890s and Nashville in 1900 and 1910, go to see Compton, and he sold them the lot. That's how 
few old acres and his wife and how Ben Cowell and his wife were able to build on that extension of Chickering Lane because Josh Compton Jr. sold them that land. During the 40s, some white racists referred to the extension of time east of Hillsborough Pike as the Nigger Road. This is particularly odious because Joshua Compton's children accomplished so much. The last remaining property belonging to a member of the Mulatto Compton family was sold by many a granddaughter of Joshua Compton in 1998 when she was about 75. For many years, she and her Cuban husband lived in a small frame house that was built after that two-story frame house burned. In 1998, one of her cherished possessions was a framed portrait of her Caucasian great-grandfather, Henry W. Compton. I know that because Larry Wolf bought a lot on Tyne on the Compton land, and he went up to see her before she left, and she showed him this portrait. In 2007, there was a Compton family reunion in Nashville that was attended by white and black family members, although no descendants of Joshua Compton were present. And I guess that's understandable because they had a hard time in Nashville and achieved a lot of success elsewhere. Uh, so that's one of the ways this book differs from a lot of histories in that I am telling the stories that people have never heard of, of Joshua Compton and uh, the story of George Dickel and the story of the South Halls Plantation, Rosemont on Mill Creek. And it's fun to research these things uh, and put them in book form. Uh, my, uh, this is Karen Coble Eaton's house on 25th Avenue South. It was built by the Reverend Tomes, the rector at Christ Episcopal Church in the 1850s. And uh, it's a fabulous house. He uh, left Christ Church in that decade because he was in favor of open pews. The problem was that the members of that church who had owned pews didn't want to open the pews, and so he left. But he, uh, he helped build that wonderful Af African-American church on Lafayette Street, uh, uh, as well as this house, which is the same style. Um, I think the most, let me ask y'all, who do you think the most benevolent person in Nashville was in the 19th century. And I'll tell you who I think. Somebody going to say Adelicia? Uh, that's not who I came up with. Uh, I, th I think it was Sam Watkins who established Watkins Institute with a $100,000 gift at the end of his life. Let me tell you a little bit about his house. It's down the street. His house was down the street from my house on Golf Club Lane. It was the highest point on Golf Club Lane between Hillsboro and today's Harding Road. Uh, the driveway came to Hillsboro. It had uh, Early, this was called the Wharton Pike, and the house, the original house, there was built by Joseph Phillips, a prominent Davidson County lawyer in 1825, and he built it on the site of Brown Station, one of those early stations in the 1780s and 90s, which was there even earlier. He gave his house to his daughter Mary, who married a prominent Nashville named Jesse Wharton. And Hillsborough Pike was originally the Wharton Pike, named for the, that family. Uh, Horton had two nephews, William H. and John H., uh, who lived there on, off the Wharton Road. Um, those boys, uh, the senior Wharton, ran for governor and had another number of prominent positions. But uh, the nephews, went to Texas, as so many Tennesseans did. They went to what became Brazoria County, Texas, 
where William was elected a United States Senator who served from 1832 until 1839. His son, William H. Wharton, named for his uncle, was a major general in the Confederate Army. Wharton County, Texas is named for two Wharton brothers, John and William. A few years ago, a friend of mine in Dallas brought a bunch of very prominent oil people to Nashville. And uh, my friend asked me to talk to them about the Tennessee-Texas connections. And uh, my wife, Irene, was sitting next to Bunker Hunt. And he, he heard what I had to say, and he said, Lord, he needs to write this down somewhere and talk about the Wharton nephews who went to Texas and the Jones who went there from Springfield and all the others who went there. Well, the next owner of the Phillips Farm was Sam Watkins. He was born in 1794 in Campbell County, Virginia. His father, Jacob, was of English descent, while his mother, Sally, was of Welsh ancestry. They had three boys and four girls, Samuel being the youngest. They made the long trek to Nashville in 1796, as so many people did, because that was the Indian, end of the Indian Wars here. And the same year, Tennessee became a state. Not long after arriving, Jacob and Sally died of typhoid fever. So Samuel was bound out as an indentured servant to William Turnbull, a Scotsman who was cruel to the little boy. Neighbors noticed the mistreatment and brought the situation to the attention of the Davidson County Court. In 1800, the court removed Watkins from the Turnbull home and placed him in the home of Jonathan and City Robinson. Robertson. This was the youngest son of James Robertson. He taught Samuel how to farm and manage animals. The little boy who didn't have an opportunity to go to school also mastered the craft of making shoes and learned to weave at Robertson's house. He learned to, I said weave, not read, but he did learn to read there too from reading the Bible. Uh, Robertson did well by him as well as he could. In 19, Watkins joined the army and fought under Jackson at the Battle of Horseshoe Bend and in the Battle of New Orleans. When peace came, he took a job in Clarks for laying bricks for a group of brick masons up there and stayed up there for 11 years until 19, 1827 when he went in business for himself in Nashville, having saved a little money. Watkins supplied the brick for many homes, business houses, and public buildings in the fast-growing city. He did so for the First Baptist Church, then on Summer Street, Fifth Avenue North. He did so for the First and Second Presbyterian Churches. He attended First Church every Sunday, First Presbyterian Church downtown, but didn't join until June 1880, two months before his death. In his prime, on weekdays, uh, Watkins would arise before daylight, cook his own breakfast, and walk to his brickyards, which were on the Charlotte Pike near Joe Johnston. Sometimes he would stop at a candy store and pick up candy, and so he always had two pockets loaded with hard candy, which he gave to children along the way. From 1827 to the beginning of the Civil War, Samuel Watkins was our most prominent builder and brickmaker. He had also a sterling reputation for integrity, prudence, industry, and economy. Often he would build a house for someone who he deemed worthy, but someone who couldn't pay for the house. He would just patiently wait and see if the boy later on would get enough money to pay him back. He was a very private person entirely free from ostentation. He seemed to get his greatest pleasure from helping others. He bought the house, the Phillips house on a 100 acre farm on Hillsborough Pike, now on Golf Club Lane in 1844. Uh, actually, that, that house was gone. Watkins built a house there, three and a half miles from town, connected to the turnpike with a long carriageway. It was on high land on today's golf club lane. He never lived there. A tenant lived there and farmed the land. Over time, he acquired over 600 acres out there, which went all the way out to the hill before you descend into Green Hills Village on both sides of the road. 
When the state started constructing its new state capital on Campbell's Hill in 1845, Watkins leased his quarry less than a mile from the capital to the state. Most of the stone for the capital came from Watkins' quarry. Later, he gave the site to the city for Watkins Park. In the 40s, Watkins built a 20-room townhouse for himself on the corner of Vauxhall, which is 9th Avenue South and McGavick Street. The two-story mansion featured long porches across the front on both floors. The house was entered through handsome mahogany double doors with Watkins' initials carved on them. The outside walls were 18 inches thick, and inside there were 11 marble fireplaces. His only living relative in Davidson County was his first cousin, William Watkins, Jr. When William died in 1847, at age 28, leaving young widow Almira Jane Cockrell Watkins to rear two children, uh, he invited this 23-year-old girl, young woman, to live with him because without an education, he knew he lacked the refinement that she had. And he thought that she, he had too big a house for one man, that she could help him and teach him good manners. She was the daughter of Mark Robertson Cockrell. She remained a widow until her death at 82. Watkins called her mother, although she was three decades younger than he was. After Miss Jane and her children moved out, Watkins rented the mansion to, for two years to Orville Ewing, who was married to Jane and William Watkins' daughter, Irene. Watkins stayed on as a member of the family, and the Ewings named a son for him. Watkins was one of the outstanding businessmen that included John Kirkman and Benjamin Lytton. Benjamin Lytton owned Lytton Hill, where Vanderbilt is today. Uh, put up the money, $100,000 to build the 28-mile-long Hillsborough Turnpike connecting Nashville with Williamson County. In the 1850 census, Watkins was listed as a brick mason who owned real estate valued at $125,000. Uh, Watkins uh, was a unionist. He opposed the war. He'd been a Whig before the war. Nevertheless, he turned his townhouse over to the Confederate Army who converted the mansion into a hospital. Later, it was ransacked and wrecked. The war wreaked havoc on his property. Federal forces confiscated buildings he owned in Nashville and used them throughout the war. His nine-acre park was demolished. The Yankees uh, quartered mules there. At the time of the Battle of Nashville, his farmhouse on Golf Club Lane was ransacked and he was robbed. Federal soldiers camped on his farm during the war, cutting down most of his beautiful shade trees. A church, Watkins Chapel, that Watkins built before the war at the corner of today's golf club lane in Hillsborough was destroyed by soldiers camped in the neighborhood. Although he was a Presbyterian, primarily Methodists used Watkins Chapel. Similarly, a schoolhouse that he built on the farm for poor boys near today's Woodmont Christian Church was destroyed. His farm was thought to have suffered damage of more than $300,000, primarily the loss of 50 slaves, outbuildings, cattle, and crops. Uh, after the war, he didn't feel sorry for himself. No longer having slaves, he couldn't go back in the brick-making business, so he did other things, and within 10 years, he had recovered the fortune that he lost during the war. Banking, president of a gas company, of the largest stockholder in National Gas Light Company and their president, uh, also a post-war director of the Tennessee Manufacturing Company and the Fourth National Bank. He was also president of Church and Spruce Street Railroad Company and served on the city's Board of Education, being president for two terms. In his last years, Watkins lived frugally in a store on the, sec on the second floor of a store he owned downtown on Church Street. Occasionally, Jane's children and grandchildren came by to visit with him. He kept helping young people, as he'd always done, but he dreamed of establishing a school where people who couldn't afford education could go to school at night, not being able to do so during the day because of their jobs. And of course, this was Watkins Institute, and his idea was that 
they would have a retail stores on the first floor to help pay. And so he left in his will $100,000 to do that. But one of the most generous things he did was that after the Civil War, he, he did not live on Golf Club Lane. He still lived in a store downtown. But he allowed his ex-slaves who were sick and other ex-slaves who were sick to live in the outhouses on his property on Golf Club Lane. And he told his supervisor to take good care of them. And to make sure that the supervisor did, the overseer, he drove out there in his carriage every week to check. So, uh, and that's when his property was auctioned and when Oscar Noel bought 263 acres of it on the east side of uh, Franklin, of uh, Hillsborough Pike. And so these are the reasons I think he was the most benevolent, kind-hearted man in the city. And it's appropriate that Watkins Institute is still well known to all of you and everybody else. Well, those are three stories from my book. You know, I could tell you about St. Bernard's Academy, but, uh, uh, and I, I, I miss some places, uh, but not too many. <laughs> I, I, I am subject to missing more when I get to Hyde's Ferry Pike and White's Creek Pike and Brick Church Pike, but I am getting local historians who are interested in those areas to help make sure that, uh, that in the tra Trail of Tears in 1837, a band of Indians, Cherokees, from over on the Owasi River did in fact go up the White's Creek Pike on the way to Kentucky, uh, Illinois, Missouri, and the Indian country. But um, as I say, I'll have volume three out in the spring. I'll have volume four out in the fall. I'll have volume five, which includes uh, 75 sites I've already written about Gallatin Pike in the spring of 2018. And uh, I'll have the last one on Donaldson, Murfreesboro Pikes, and Nolansville. And, uh, even the Franklin College and Stones River Pike, which you've never heard of, which was uh, went by Fanning's school that David Lipscomb went to where our, our, our uh, airport is today. And that'll be in the fall of 2018, if I'm alive. If I am not alive, I have told my son Ridley to publish those that I missed because I've, all, I've already written them and all he's got to do is to get Dimples Kellogg to edit them. And Gary Gore, who has edited books at Vanderbilt for 50 years, to, uh, to do the design. But uh, I honestly think these books are going to be on Nashville bookshelves 100 years from now. And it's been a real pleasure to write. And if anybody's got any questions, I'm happy to try to answer them. Bob can answer them if I can. <laughs> uh, well, first of all, uh, I'm going to give an advance uh, invitation to come to our Bellevue History Gene Genealogy Group and talk about your new book. Theology uh, Group? Is that what you said? Our Bellevue History, the group oh, we talked about. History Group. Okay. The history Gene and Genealogy. Genealogy, not theology. <laughs> no, no, no. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, I'm not too much into theology. But uh, anyway, uh, I just had a question. How do you go, if you research it from uh, newspapers, family letters, what is your basis for doing the uh, uh, research? Yeah, um, well, I, you know, I was doing, doing some research in Bellamy Country Club and I went back to a letter that George McGugan's daddy wrote me in the 50s telling me about some roads for where the golf course were and I still had the letter. And so I, I have accumulated, I mean, Frank Stevens, a physician here, from 1908 to, his, to about 1955, had a sanitarium on the Murfreesboro Pike where Trevecca is. And I was asking Frank 25 or 30 years ago where the Nashville Sanitarium was. He said, really, if it was on the Murfreesboro Pike near City View Sanitarium, our sanitarium, he would have told me. So I don't know where the Nashville Pike is, but that letter, which I still got, helped me write about City View Hospital. In 1936, my grandfather, Ridley Wills, 
who was the president of National Life and Action Insurance Company and brilliant, had a mental breakdown. And for the last 12 years of his life, he was in, St in uh, City View Sanitarium on the hill behind Trevecca. And I didn't know it then, I know it now, but my wife Irene's grandfather, William Archer, she, William Cheatham Weaver, who had a business on Second Avenue, he was out there at the same time. He had cancer of the tongue that was extremely painful. And two of the Harrises that Irene is kin to, who lived on Edmondson Pike, spent their last years at City View Sanitarium in rocking chairs with their faces touching the wall. Now the reason I know that is that Herschel Gallo was a good friend of mine, and he grew up on the Mercerboro Pike where his daddy had a store. And he told me those stories, and I've got long letters. He wrote his daughter, Allison. So a lot of what I'm, I've got, Bob, is in my own library or my files, or I come up here or I go to the state library and find out. I haven't relied a great deal on the internet to find out what I'm doing. Maybe I should, but, uh, but I, I, you're, a, you're, a, you're a tremendous treasure to the city. Well, thank you. It's been fun. Yes. Uh, this goes back to City View Sanitarium because I've been researching that. I didn't realize it until I looked at an old map and saw it. But when when did that close as a facility? It was, wasn't it around until the 1960s? Yeah. And then and I Stevens know, died. Oh, okay. He had a son who was a doctor, and that's who I found out a lot of information about. Okay, and didn't they, the city got that property, right? And that's now the I, extension I, no, of the Lane. Trevecca bought the property, and tore it down. But didn't Fester's Lane dead end? No, Fester's yeah. The lane yeah. was right over, that's where TIS was, on Fester's Lane. No, wasn't that on Foster? It? Yeah, Foster Avenue, okay. close by. But on old maps it shows that Fester's Lane dead ended rather than crossing uh, Murfreesboro and across the street where it dead ended to well, was the sanitarium. You know who else was out there? It was Walden University, the black university. It was there on part of that Trevecca. And Trevecca acquired it when they moved out there from the Warner place on the Gallatin Pike. I know there's nothing out that out there. It's all yeah. developed and I haven't been up to look with I don't think there's anything there. <coughs> but you were researching City View? Well, just because I noticed Which map did you find City View on? One of the ones in the archives, what um well, one from maybe from the nineteen fifties, like the nineteen fifty eight city map that was still shown. But what was interesting, uh, Fessler's Lane did not appear. It was extended from Murfreesboro Road at Polk sometime, I guess, in the 70s, and it went mm -hmm. through what was appeared to be city use. Well, in, in this book, I, you know, I write about Hobbs Lane in, in Green Hills. Well, it's named for Bill Hobbs, the farmer, who loved to fox hunt in all those hills in southern Davidson County, northern Williamson County. And I didn't know that until I researched it. But uh, I pretty much nailed everybody's house along Hillsboro. In my Harding Pike book, I'm gonna put more photographs because somebody at Belmont, historic Belmont said, really there's one thing wrong with your book. I said, what's that? I thought it made some grievous error. He said, you didn't put enough pictures in. So I'm gonna make sure I take care of that. And I've got 51 pictures to deliver to my designer this afternoon. Yes, sir. Do all your books take in the same 150 years? All, this series of National Pikes all will. And what, what It's going to go from about eight, 1780 to 1930, ending up with Cheekwood and Far Hills, my grandparents' home, built that year that became the governor's mansion. Anybody? Yes, sir. There at Hobbs Road in Hillsboro, do you have any... You know, the, did the Hobbs farm, was that? That's the Hobbs farm, who was there. And the Griswolds had a restaurant there, much later that you were there. Was it Nelson Griswold, was that his Nelson, name? yeah. Yeah. Um, I'll tell a story. Uh, I practiced veterinary medicine on Hillsborough Road for, and my daddy before me for about 40 years and still on the property. That's how I'm living. I make a living these days. It's retired. Um, 
I was sitting in there one day, and I don't know the names. I, I can't remember the names of all these people. But a lady came in and brought her dog and told me a story of her her farm was on the same property. Was she a hog? I don't know. I What's thought it was Niederheiser, but it could have been hog. But whoever it was, she said uh, the house was right here, and behind us was a was a uh, silo. And said, my daddy used to. It was either a daddy or a granddaddy he used to get all drunk, and when he did, he got me. So it's so her mother used to take him, and when he you know passed out. And hang him like this in the in the empty silo until he sobered. <laughs> oh my God! That's some story. I missed that one. <laughs> Any other questions? Well, I hope you'll look at these books, and if you don't have one, put it in your library. I'm realizing that some more are coming. And I brought one of my Nashville Streets book because it just has been very popular. People keep it in their cars, and as they drive around town and see a street, they don't know why it's named that. They look and find out, for the most part. Well, thanks. Thank you. Well, I hope you've enjoyed today's presentation. I appreciate you being here, and if you're watching online, I appreciate you doing that today for us. Uh, Ridley had a great talk today, and I want to thank him for being here. Uh, I want to thank the uh, Nashville the Metro Nashville Network for filming today. And uh, we have a great lineup. In January, we will have uh, Rockin Wagner talking about streetcars in Nashville. And in February, we'll have Dr. Carol Busey, the county, Davidson County historian. And she will be talking on segregation in Nashville schools. So tune in and hope you can attend.